Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke. Dane reads. So this is a collection of short stories and also has some illustrations in it. In fact, I won't show you some now because I've got some tabbed out that I want to show you. So I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through, check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So... The author of more than 50 books, with over 15 million copies in print, Arthur C. Clarke is one of the world's most distinguished figures in modern science and science fiction. He is the inventor of the concept of the communications satellite, a past chairman of the British Interplanetary Society, and a member of the Academy of Astronomics. His novel, Rendezvous with Rama, won science fiction's three highest honours, the Hugo, Nebula, and John W. Campbell Awards. His two Odyssey novels, 2001 A Space Odyssey and 2010 Odyssey 2, were both major international bestsellers. The Sentinel is a magnificent collection of Arthur C. Clarke's finest shorter fiction spanning four decades. Included here, along with revealing new introductions, are The Sentinel, the story that inspired 2001, Guardian Angel, the rarely glimpsed work that gave birth to childhood's end, The Songs of Distant Earth, a brilliant haunting story of first contact with an alien world, and other outstanding stories of vaulting imagination. Stunningly illustrated with templates by internationally acclaimed artist Labeus Woods, The Sentinel will grace the collection of every Arthur C. Clarke reader and every lover of fine science fiction. So this is one of the books that I got as part of this big job lot of sci-fi that I uh, won on eBay. So I thought this was interesting from the short story Rescue Party. When a creature of Palador spoke, the pronoun it used was always we. There was not, nor could there ever be, any first person singular in the language of Palador. Just like that, like, that appealed to me because I'm a grammar nerd and a language nerd, you know? Uh, another great quote here, just a short one. This is from Breaking Strain. News that is sufficiently bad somehow carries its own guarantee of truth. Only good reports need confirmation. And so uh, this story is about two people called Grant and McNeil who are both like on a spaceship and the oxygen's running out and there might be enough oxygen for just one of them but not for them both. And uh, we get the smell of cigarette smoke and it says, that was, This was the excuse he needed and he had seized upon it to salve his conscience for though he might plan and even carry out a murder, Grant was the sort of person who would have to do it according to his own particular moral code. As it happened, he was, not for the first time, badly misjudging McNeil. The engineer was a heavy smoker and tobacco was quite essential to his mental well-being, even in normal circumstances. How much more essential it was now, Grant, who only smoked occasionally and without much enjoyment, could never have appreciated. McNeil had satisfied himself by careful calculation that four cigarettes a day would make no measurable difference whatsoever to the ship's oxygen endurance, whereas they would make all the difference in the world to his own nerves and hence indirectly to Grant's. But it was no use explaining this to Grant. So he had smoked in private and with a self-control he found agreeably, almost voluptuously surprising. It was sheer bad luck that Grant had detected one of the day's four cigarettes. So Grant makes a poisoned cup of coffee to try and kill off McNeil and we get this. He watched, fascinated, though without appearing to do so, as McNeil toyed with his cup. The engineer seemed in no great hurry and was staring moodily into space. Then he put his lips to the drinking tube and sipped. A moment later he spluttered slightly and an icy hand seemed to seize Grant's heart and hold it tight. Then McNeil turned to him and said evenly, you've made it properly for once, it's quite hot. Slowly Grant's heart resumed its interrupted work. He did not trust himself to speak but managed a non-committal nod. McNeil parked the cup carefully in the air a few inches away from his face. He seemed very thoughtful, as if weighing his words for some important remark. Grant cursed himself for having made the drink so hot. That was just the sort of detail that hanged murderers. If McNeil waited much longer he would probably betray himself through nervousness. And there's a twist coming in this, and it's a, quite an obvious twist, I've got to say, to be honest. So onto The Sentinel, it's got a really cool illustration for that one. And I'm going to read you um, Clark's little introductory essay here. He says, Next to the star and the nine billion names of God, I suppose The Sentinel is my best known short story, though not for itself, but as the seed from which 2001 A Space Odyssey sprang, 20 years after it was written in 1948. I wonder if I even noticed Christmas that year. Opus 62 bears the date 23rd to 26th of September. Unlike most of my short stories, this one was aimed at a specific target, which it missed completely. The BBC had just announced a short story competition. I submitted the Sentinel hot from the typewriter and got it back a month later. Somehow, I've never had any luck with such contests. A few years later, I wrote The Star specifically for a London Observer competition on the subject 2500 AD. It too was bounce, though the judges were perceptive enough to give an award to one Brian Aldiss. I'm continually annoyed by careless references to The Sentinel as the story on which 2001 is based. It bears about as much relation to the movie as an acorn to the resultant full-grown oak. Considerably less, in fact, because ideas from several other stories were also incorporated. Even the elements that Stanley Kubrick and I did actually use were considerably modified. Thus, the glittering, roughly pyramidal structure, set in the rock like a gigantic, many-faceted jewel, became, after several modifications, the famous black monolith. 
and the locale was moved from the Mare Crisium to the most spectacular of all lunar craters, Tycho, easily visible to the naked eye from Earth at full moon. Sometime after The Sentinel was published, I was asked if I had ever read Jack London's The Red One, 1918. As I'd never even heard of it, I hastened to do so, and was deeply impressed by his 30 year earlier tale of the Starborn, an enormous sphere lying for ages in the jungles of Guadalcanal. I wonder if this is the first treatment of a theme which has suddenly become topical now that the focus of the SETI debate has changed from where's everyone to the even more puzzling, where are their artifacts? I just thought this was a really cool uh, illustration and, the, and if it looks to you as though um, the dimensions of the human figure are off, that's why. Um, so I'm going to read you the opening paragraph here because it gives you the descri description of this guy. Professor Forster is such a small man that a special spacesuit had to be made for him. But what he lacked in physical size, he more than made up, as in so often the case, I think it should be as is so often the case, in sheer drive and determination. When I met him, he'd spent 20 years pursuing a dream. What is more to the point, he had persuaded a whole succession of hard-headed businessmen, world council delegates and administrators of scientific trusts to underwrite his expenses and to fit out a ship for him. Despite everything that happened later, I still think that was his most remarkable achievement. All right, then there's this really cool image here that I wanted to share with you guys. Very sweet, very dope. And so moving on to Refugee, and again, I'm just going to read the little introductory essay here. It's funny because one of the reasons I really like reading Isaac Asimov is that he does a lot of these really cool essays as well. So it was funny to see Arthur C. Clarke doing something similar, and uh, obviously I really enjoyed them. Doubtless to the great confusion of anthologists, this story has been published under three other titles, Royal Prerogative, This Earth of Majesty, and Question Mark. Now how do you index that? It was written in 1954, and I cannot pretend that no resemblance was intended to any living character. Indeed, I have since met the prototype of Prince Henry on three occasions, and on the last, here in Colombo, only a few months ago, we had a conversation uncannily appropriate to this story. Our first meeting, I mentioned, had been at an exhibition circa 1958, optimistically called Britain Enters the Space Race. His Royal Highness laughed and answered wryly, we never did, did we? Not quite true, of course, since there are many British satellites in orbit, and there will soon be a few Britons, courtesy the US Space Shuttle as well. Shouldn't it be courtesy of? But that isn't exactly what I had in mind. Well, Sir Isaac Newton invented gravity. Perhaps one day we British might be lucky enough to disinvent it. And uh, this story is one that I've read before, I'll show you the image there. And it's basically um, about um, the British heir to the throne sneaking on board a spaceship so that he can go and have an adventure, much to the chagrin of like his royal minders, you know? So we'll move on to the wind from the sun. So uh, a couple of paragraphs here I, I want to read out about the importance of eating. I'm terrible at remembering to eat and I live on Earth, so I'd be even worse in space. He reset the alarm, ready for the next natural or man-made emergency. Perhaps Gossamer or one of the other contestants would try the same trick again. Meanwhile, it was time to eat, though he did not feel particularly hungry. One used little physical energy in space and it was easy to forget about food. Easy and dangerous, for when an emergency arose, you might not have the reserves needed to deal with it. He broke open the first of the meal packets and inspected it without enthusiasm. The name on the label, Space Tasties, was enough to put him off. And he had grave doubts about the promise printed underneath, guaranteed crumbless. It had been said that crumbs were a greater danger to space vehicles than meteorites. They could drift into the most unlikely places, causing short circuits, blocking vital jets, and getting into instruments that were supposed to be hermetically sealed. So here we have a day to remember. And that, and that story there was basically about a few different people racing to be like, uh, it's like a race to the far side of the moon and back. And, uh, you know, for entertainment rather, rather than research, which I thought was pretty cool. So here we have a meeting with, with Medusa, and I enjoyed this because of the word simp, which is obviously a bit of a meme these days. The human workers waved to him, and the simps flashed toothy smiles as he walked through the confusion into the already completed Sky Lounge. Well, that's what you get for masturbating to Belle Delphine. And uh, here, this is just a reference to the Hindenburg disaster, which is something I find fascinating. Like I've heard that, listen to the radio transcripts and watch documentaries on it and stuff. The last moments of the Queen would never fill millions with awe and terror, as had those of the Hindenburg a century and a half before. Oh, the humanity! And here we get this line here, which is a vegan I don't particularly approve of. No, said Falcon, answering Mission Control's repeated questions about the Mantas. They're still showing no reaction to me. I don't think they're intelligent. They look like harmless vegetarians. I don't think he was trying to say that vegetarians are unintelligent, though. Well, they kind of are, because they're not vegan, but... And here, uh, again, as part of a meeting with Medusa, we get this... Um, then we have to play safe and assume intelligence. For the present, therefore, this expedition comes under all the clauses of the Prime Directive. There was a long silence while everyone on the radio circuit absorbed the implications of this. 
For the first time in the history of spaceflight, the rules that had been established through more than a century of argument might have to be applied. Man had, it was hoped, profited from his mistakes on Earth. Not only moral considerations, but also his own self-interest demanded that he should not repeat them among the planets. It could be disastrous to treat a superior intelligence as the American settlers had treated the Indians, or as almost everyone had treated the African. Alright, and finally, uh, got a little introduction essay here. It's quite a long one, so I'm only going to read a little bit of it, but it's uh, from the Songs of Distant Earth. And uh, this is interesting because he covers the difference between science fiction and fantasy. He says, I had just seen two spectacular and highly successful space movies, Star Wars, Close Encounters of a Third Kind, and Star Trek was still doing reruns all over the planet. They were well done and I greatly enjoyed them, but they all had one thing in common. They were not, in the strictest sense, science fiction, but fantasy. Now, I like fantasy every bit as much as science fiction. Its literary standards are usually higher too. But I recognise the distinction between the genres. Critics have been trying for decades to define both categories without much success. Here is my working definition. Fantasy is something that couldn't happen in the real world, though often you wish it would. Science fiction is something that really could happen, though often you'd be sorry if it did. Today we are 99.99% certain that it will always be impossible to travel faster than light, which means that journeys to even the nearest star systems will take decades. This is no problem to the fantasy writer, who can happily cling to the 0.01% chance that there may be a loophole that Einstein didn't notice, and go racing around the galaxy saving civilization once a week in prime time. So yeah, The Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke, I particularly enjoyed this edition because of all the illustrations as well, but the stories in it were great as well. Uh, as I say, I had read one of them before, but it was actually one that I did enjoy when I first read it as well. And uh, overall just some really fascinating food for thought here, so uh, I gave it a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.